Okay, exercise nine deals with the axial skeleton. Remember the axial skeleton is comprised of the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage. So we're going to start at the top and we're going to move down. The skull is composed of two divisions, if you will, the cranium and the facial bones. The cranium is composed of eight bones that do protect the brain. And then the facial bones, there's 14 of them. Uh, they are forming the, the facial structures as the name implies. And they also help to support the eyes and protect the eyes. So with the cranium, the bones that we have there, we have the frontal, we have two parietal, two temporal, the occipital, the sphenoid, and the asmoid bone. So remember there are eight of them. Uh, this is an example of where the very beginning of AMP learning your anatomical region terms becomes very helpful because you should already be familiar where the occipital region is, where the temporal region is, where the frontal region is, etc. And so that, that should help you with it. In this diagram from this angle it is showing the uh, various locations of the bones, once again, the occipital, the temporal, parietal, frontal, and then you've got the sphagnoid bone and the ethmoid bone. One study practice that I think is helpful for students is to print off copies that are unlabeled of the skeleton, put the copy into a plastic sleeve, and then you use a, a marker and label them. Once you've labeled it once, then wipe off, clean that plastic sleeve, and then you can label it multiple times. That repetition really, really helps. Another thing that does help feedback I've gotten from students is if you can find a coloring book or else, once again, print off your own copy and sit there and physically color in the bones. There is something about that practice of coloring them in that helps you to remember them. So see what works for you. Different things work for different people. But you might want to try one of those. For the facial bones, you'll notice that a lot of these, there's two of them as well. <coughs> you have the nasal, the lacrimal, zygomatic, the inferior nasal conca, the palatine, the bulmar, maxilla, and mandible. And this is showing the location of all of those various bones. As you said, it is helping to form the facial features as well as protecting the eyes. With the uh, skull, you do have four paranasal sinuses. These are cavities. They should be filled with air. Sometimes when you get an infection, they become uh, filled with basically fluid and, and pus. And then that's when you feel the pressure on them. If any of you have had a sinus infection, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But there's four different pairs of them. And so <coughs> in this diagram, it does show the four different pairs along with their names. We have right up in this area, oops, um, the paranasal sinuses, you've got the frontal ones. They're often named by the location of them as well. The hyoid bone, this is included with this kind of usually when you're studying the skull, although it's not part of it, and that is because it is right underneath the skull. It's in the front, kind of right underneath um, the mandible. The mandible, by the way, is your lower jaw, and that is the only movable bone in the skull. So it's right here underneath it. It's, it's kind of on like horseshoe shaped. It does provide a lot of muscle attachment uh, for both the throat and also muscles attached there for the, the tongue. The vertebral column, the purpose is that it is helping to protect the spinal cord. Uh, it is divided into, into sections. You, starting at the superficial at the top, you have seven cervical vertebrae. Then you have the 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, 
The sacrum is five fused vertebrae together, and then the coccyx is four fused vertebrae together. The vertebrae have certain characteristics of them that you can use to identify one from the other. A couple of features that you may notice is right here. This is known as the foramen. This is where the spinal cord is going through. And notice the shape of it versus the size of it. So this is the foramen also. So the spinal cord is running through here. This right here is the body, and it gets larger as you move down because you have to support more weight. And so that is certainly something that, that you will notice. Uh, you'll notice the structure back here as well of these faucets that are processes off of the back. And if you look at the side of the uh, vertebrae, another thing that you notice has to do with um, the, the way the process looks. And what I'm going to point out, this is a thoracic, these are the thoracic vertebrae right here. So when you look at it from a lateral view, from the side of it, notice the spinous process right here. This is on the back. Notice how it is pointing downward, but the lumbar one is pointing just straight back. That is a very significant big difference that you can use to help to identify a vertebrae when you're looking at it from the side or the lateral view. That's also going to help identify when you need to be able to feel down the vertebral column and help you to feel for, say, doing a spinal tap or lumbar puncture, as they call it. The cervical vertebrae. The first two have special names, the C1, and we will give them the letter by cervical, thoracic, lumbar, etc., and then number them in the order starting superficially and moving down. So the C1 is the uppermost vertebrae. It's known as the atlas, and the C2 is known as the axis. These are the only two that have special names to them. They have special modifications on them so that they, uh, the way they fit together, that allows you to move your head up and down in like a yes, no fashion or left to right. The thoracic vertebrae, as you can see um, here, the depiction again, that the spine is process on the posterior side is pointing down. The side view of the, the vertebral column also notice that there are curvatures there. Um, the sacrum and thoracic curvatures, those are known as the primary curvatures. The secondary are the lumbar and uh, cervical. They form a little bit later. Uh, the proper orientation of them, once the cervical uh, curvature is formed, that's when the baby can now hold its head up. And when the lumbar curvature is properly aligned, that's typically then when a baby is able to stand up on its own. This is showing the lumbar vertebrae. Notice how thick those spinous processes are and that they're sticking straight out. The sacrum, as I said, remember those five vertebrae that fuse together. And then the coccyx, that is going to be abbreviated as CO instead of C to distinguish between the cervical ones. That is four cervical vertebrae that are fused together. And then they're showing the coccyx right there. The thoracic cage is composed of your thoracic vertebrae, your ribs, your sternum, and then the coastal cartilages that will attach the ribs in the front to the sternum itself. The sternum is divided into three different parts. You have the manubrium, you have the body, and the xiphoid process. The body is where you want your hands positioned if you're doing CPR. You do not want to be positioned on the xiphoid process which is down here at the bottom, because if you are placing your hand so you're applying pressure to the xiphoid process, this can actually break and it can actually be pushed down even if it doesn't break off of the sternum. 
and puncture the liver, which is right below it. So you want to be positioned over the body of the, the sternum when doing CPR. The ribs, there are 12 pairs of ribs. All of them will articulate or join, articulation is a join, with the vertebral column in the, the posterior side. But on the anterior the front side, only the first seven will articulate to the sternum by the cartilage, by the coastal cartilage. So the first uh, seven are referred to as your two ribs. The lower five are referred to as the false ribs because they don't attach directly to the sternum. Ribs eight through ten, they will attach to cartilage, which then has to attach to the cartilage from rib number seven. So it's a roundabout way that it's attached. And then ribs 11 and 12 are also known as your floating ribs because they are not attached to the sternum at all. So in this diagram, you can see the blue right here. This is the coastal cartilage. So the tan is the rib, and you, you have this cartilage that is attaching the rib to the sternum. Now, you have seven that is attaching also to the, the sternum by the cartilage, but ribs eight, nine, and ten, these three right here, their cartilage attaches to the cartilage on number seven, which then attaches to the rib. And so that's why eight, nine, and ten are false ribs. And if you can see on this diagram down here, you can see ribs 11 and 12 back here. They, as I said, everything attaches to the vertebral column in the back, but they do not attach to the sternum in the front. The fetal skull, the bone is still forming. Uh, it's not completely connected or in the skull from one bone to the other where we have our sutures, which is a type of joint at birth. This allows for the brain to continue growing. It also allows the head to, to move a bit during the birthing process. So there is cartilage, which is known as the fontanelle regions, where, as you can see here by the arrows, the bones are still going to to grow the parietal bones, there's two of them, remember, and they're going to, to come together and form a suture right along here. And then the occipital bone in the back is going to form sutures between it and the parietal bones. And then the frontal bones are going to form a suture between each other and then between the frontal bone with the parietal bone. But to allow movement, you do have these these fontanelles, commonly referred to as soft spots of the brain. After birth, um, over time, they will eventually um, go through ossification and will be formed. You can often see the anterior fontanelle, which is right here. It's also in this diagram right here. Especially if your baby doesn't have a lot of hair, you can kind of see it. Um, I know my kids, if they got upset and they're crying a lot, you could kind of see it moving, you know, as uh, associated with blood pressure, etc. Um, but it's it, it's to allow for the brain to increase in size. The brain is still growing, and you don't want a, this completely sealed, closed environment. The skull needs to be able to grow with it.